Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 246, recorded on June 22nd, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. I'm on location in Bozeman, Montana, so apologies for any odd sounds, but let's do the news. This week, Akamai Security Research lifted the public embargo on Punjab, a new peer-to-peer botnet they're warning customers about, and that's been breaching Linux servers since March. Written in Go, and fully taking advantage of Golang's excellent concurrency to maximize its effectiveness at spreading and executing malware, Panchan relies on memory-mapped files to avoid detection via its on-disk presence, while also reportedly stopping any of its crypto mining processes when it detects someone looking for it. <laughs> Sneaky. While the botnet performs crypto mining, there is also this god mode built in. It's a control panel of sorts that lets you make it do all kinds of things. It's built right into the binary, but you can't just access it. You have to have a private key. And only after the malware requests that private key and you provide it, then the validation occurs and you get access to its quote-unquote god mode. You know, this is a little bit amusing. You hear a lot of folks raving about Golang because it's easy to distribute as a small binary. It has excellent concurrency. It's got a great web server built right into the standard library. Turns out that also makes great malware. Now, when you go to try to find this malware, turns out it's continuously looking for both top and htop. So, pro tip, use one of the more obscure picks for top programs we've had on Linux Unplugged, and maybe you won't get caught. Anyway, if it does find you snooping, the malware terminates the mining processes so that you just don't see anything wrong on your system. It goes a little bit further, though. It does need to remain persistent, so Panchan copies itself into a file named slash bin slash systemd worker and even goes so far as to create a systemd service to try to appear as a legitimate part of systemd. So looking for a systemd worker process is one of the few ways you might actually be able to detect this thing. I think that's essentially like the authors of this malware figured, hey, you know, systemd is complicated. If people see a systemd worker process, they'll think it's legit. Put it over there. <laughs> I guess so. According to the researchers, the malware actually also performs SSH dictionary attacks as well. So when it gets onto a Linux box, instead of just trying to brute force onto other systems on the LAN, like most botnets do, this malware reads the IDRSA file and your known host files to harvest existing credentials and existing known good hosts, and then move laterally across the network onto those boxes. But if that doesn't work, well, this thing can also do good old-fashioned password brute forcing. A malware can also randomize IP addresses and attempt a dictionary attack using a predetermined user and password list. Now, we definitely don't cover most of these, and, and there are many, but when we do see one with some legs, we want to bring it to your attention. Right now, most of the victims are located in Asia, followed by a good set in Europe, with particular exploitation of university and educational networks. However, concerning for some of us out there, most notably myself, Akamai has noted that VPSs tend to be a target as well. As we mentioned before, a quick way to check is to look out for that systemd worker process, uh, but you can also look out for processes listening on TCP port 1919, or sending outgoing traffic on 3380 or 3387. Firefox's slow startup times on the latest Ubuntu release continue to be a source of frustration for users weeks after the latest release. In fact, OMG Ubuntu recently tweeted that it takes 19 seconds on their system for Firefox to start. And it seems the root of the issue is Ubuntu now ships Firefox as a snap package, which as of now introduces quite a bit of launch overhead. Well, this week we did get an update from Canonical's Oliver Smith about their latest efforts to improve Firefox Snap performance and some other outstanding issues with the sandboxed version of one of our favorite web browsers. Their focus, it seems, is wider, though, than just launch times, with a lot of work going into ensuring GPU-based rendering will work in more situations and making sure that when it can't, it'll fall back to CPU-based rendering. Chris, you may also like this little tidbit. There's some work going into solving rendering issues on the Raspberry Pi as well. That is really nice to see. It's nice to see all of that, especially the GPU rendering stuff and, and fixing it when it doesn't quite work right. That's absolutely a win. 
Uh, but what I read from this is, sorry, guys, there's not a lot we can do about the startup times. Um, it seems like they are addressing one of the big factors in the first launch time, which is a really a killer on Firefox. The Ubuntu developers are working with Mozilla to change Firefox so it behaves like it does on Windows, where only one locale would be loaded at, t at, at the launch time based on the system's local settings. I think that just makes sense. But that's that's a one-time launch issue. That's not like a daily cold boot launch problem that I think is really frustrating for Ubuntu users long term. And in my opinion, that's really the one that seems to be like the most public and giving Snap a bad reputation. But I suspect it's just kind of inherently the way Snaps are built. And there's only so much the developers can do. So they're looking at optimizing all of the other layers of this Firefox Snap to try to eke as much performance from there because there's not a ton they can do about the initial launch time. This just might not be a completely solvable problem, but they're going to give it their best. So my advice would be set your expectations accordingly. Last month, in a surprise announcement, we learned that longtime Qt developer Lars Knoll would be leaving the Qt company. But not only is he leaving the CTO position, He's also leaving the post of longtime Qt chief maintainer for the open source project. Longtime is right. Lars has been heavily involved with the Qt toolkit for 25 years. He started with KDE and Qt in the late 90s and then became a prominent Troll Tech employee in 2000. After a round of voting by the Qt developers, Vocal Hillsmeyer has been selected as the new Qt chief maintainer. In fact, Lars himself announced the new maintainer just a few days ago, writing, quote, Volker, I would like to wish you good luck with leading the project. I know that the Qt project is going to be in very good hands with you. Volker serves as the director of R&D for graphics and UI at the Qt company and has been with the Qt company for the past three and a half years. Well, back from 2000 to 2011, he worked for Trolltech and Nokia in various roles working on the Qt toolkit. This week marked 38 years since the inaugural release of the X window system at MIT. It was way back when, on June 19th, 1984, that Bob Scheifler first announced the X window system, X1. When X was introduced, for a little context, its performance was, quote, about twice that of W, which was the prior window system made at Stanford. Crucially, X also marked the first window system that was both vendor and hardware independent, something we kind of take for granted these days. If, like us, you want to get your deep, nerdy nostalgia on, we'll have the original release announcement in the show notes. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you go there to show some support for this here show. It lets Linode know you heard about it here. They've been hard at work for over... 18 years, nearly 19 years, creating the best experience to run applications on Linux. I've tried a lot of hosting platforms out there. Nobody gets the mix and the ratios right, like Linode does. If you'd like to build yourself something from the ground up or click a one deploy like type button and get an application up on a server, Linode will span that whole range for newbies or pros. In fact, you know, I don't know if I've ever mentioned it in a read, but uh, they offer a one-click deployment of Pi-hole. And when you start thinking about maybe like a tail scale mesh network or a, a VPN setup or something like a trustable DNS that you could use on your mobile device, Pi-hole up on a Linode makes a lot of sense. And of course, you could do things like we do where you build something up from the ground up using Nix OS and basically take that Linode down to the metal. So that whole range, they manage to strike a balance and make it accessible to you. And of course, I appreciate while I'm on the road, I'm not worried about my Linodes. They have some really sane monitoring just set up by default i got an alert about uh, our jupiter tube box that runs on linode and it, it's like your bandwidth usage is way up and that's fine but it was nice to get that threshold and just check on everything and make sure there wasn't anything odd happening i love those same defaults and the real easy way i can back things up and take snapshots before we make any major changes and of course they have a bunch of back-end services that make linode great too like S3-compatible object storage, VLAN support, a powerful DNS manager, Kubernetes and Terraform and Ansible support as well. After you've been using Linode for a minute, you're going to really appreciate that all these things come together in a really nice kind of, I, I almost hate to say it, but like low-key way. Like if you never want to interact with their slick, sweet API, 
You don't have to. But if you start using the service and you want to take things to the next level, you totally can. And the pricing is fantastic. 30 to 50% cheaper than those hyperscalers that want to lock you into their crazy platforms. So go try it for the best customer support. Super fast networking, crazy fast rigs, 11 data centers around the world, and a Linux culture that runs deep. The only thing that could make it better is that $100. So go to linode.com slash land. Get that $100 credit. Try it out. Kick the tires. Build something. Learn something. And support the show. Linode.com slash LAN. At the Open Source Summit North America event this week, Linus Torvalds sat down with Dirk Hondel for one of their famous fireside chats. So my name is Dirk Hondel. I'm the chief open source officer for the Cardano Foundation, which I joined a couple of months ago. I'm focused on building stronger open source communities and ecosystems around our blockchain technologies. This guy does... Yeah, I'm Linus, and the reason we do these uh, fireside chats is I, I do software. I don't do public talking, and this makes it much easier for me. Uh, so. <laughs> this conversation ranges from a few new topics to some classics, but maybe Linus's best take on those classics yet. One of those is a refresh on his never-break-user-space stance. So I don't like the f notion that people talk about APIs. Because let's face it, some people then look at documentation, right? And say, this is the API. This is what we documented. If you don't do what we documented, it's on you, right? And I feel that's a complete cop-out, and uh, it's, it's just bad policy. Uh, documentation is worthless compared to reality. and. Uh, I say that as a software engineer who never writes documentation. So uh, part of this is my own personal biases, obviously. But my rule has always been, it's not that we can't break the API. You, well, I tell my sub-maintainers and, and developers all the time that you can change anything, but you can't break people's loads. You can't break what people do. And if they take advantage of a bug in the kernel, that bug is not a bug, it's a feature. And we will maintain that feature forever unless there are like really pressing concerns and usually the only really pressing concern is security. Uh, where we will go to insane lengths to, to actually keep bug for bug compatibility because as a user, which I also am, the most annoying thing I can imagine is doing a software upgrade and things stop working, right? And I can't affect the fact that every single package around me may have different policies, but when it comes to the kernel, I've uh, been very hard-nosed about the policy that when it comes kernel does not do that. If you upgrade the kernel, you should feel safe in knowing that whatever you used to do will still continue to work. And if it doesn't, you're supposed to scream at us, right? You're not supposed to say, oh, I upgraded the kernel and now I need to change what I used to do. No, you should feel like it's a bug report if something breaks. And, and we've been pretty successful with that and I feel very strongly about it. And I wish since most of you are not kernel developers, I wish that you would push for this kind of policy on your project because it makes it so much better for all your users. And in the end, we're all in this for the technology and we are in this because we enjoy programming, hopefully. But in the end, it's really the users that matter. A project with no users is not a project. It's just you playing with your own code. But then we get down to business, and Dirk asks, where is Rust for the kernel, and why is it taking so long? The kernel has gotten a bit more careful over the years, <laughs> let's put it that way. We were doing, we were more freewheeling 30 years ago. We definitely, I mean, it was more of a wild west where uh, somebody came up with a great idea and sent a patch and it would just get merged because, hey, why not? And, and we can't really afford to do that. And a lot of people actually think we're somewhat too risk averse. Yeah. So um, when it comes to Rust, it's being discussed for multiple years by now. It's getting to the point where 
real soon now. Uh, we will actually have it merged in the kernel. Uh, maybe next release. Uh, so. Uh, before the rest people get all excited, right? You know who you are. Uh, to, to me, it's, um, it's a trial run, right? It's a way of making, A, we want to have the memory safety. So there are real technical reasons why Rust is a good idea in the kernel. But at the same time, it's one of those things. We tried C++ 25 plus years ago, and uh, we tried it for two weeks, and then we stopped trying it. And it seems a fear that's been building in the community gets some voice on stage. Sure, Rust is neat and all, but is it really that great of an idea to introduce a language into the kernel that most developers don't understand? I think that introducing Rust, I have seen the worries about it meaning that people don't understand Rust, and that's okay. People don't understand the VM subsystem even when it's written in C. So the language is usually not the biggest hindrance to understanding. We will have maintainers for the Rust parts exactly the same way we have maintainers for the VM parts. And, and that's not really, it's a small technical change, not a fundamental one. Security and trust were also clearly on Dirk's mind during the chat. And he asked Linus how the kernel team can reasonably keep the entire stack secure. The only way to make security work, because bugs will happen, if they don't happen in hardware, they will happen in software. And if they don't happen in your software, they will happen in somebody else's software. Yes. Uh, so just accept bugs, including the security ones. And the only way to try to make, do security right is, is by having layers of security. I like Linus's point there that you kind of have to plan on bugs, either in your software or someone else's code. But he also does a little bit of a reality check and admits we're probably never going to be 100% secure. You'll never get there. You'll never, anybody who thinks you can get 100% secure is living in some dream world that is just not this reality. Serious security talk aside, one of our favorite moments was Linus just having a bit of a laugh for being better known as the creator of Git, at least in some circles. Linux is kind of my baby, and I've been doing it for 30 years plus, and, and it's what I do. Uh, my oldest daughter, when she went off to college and did computer science, I didn't push her, uh, she, she emailed me back like a few months, a few weeks later, and, and was laughing at the fact that, that I was known for Git at the computer science uh, department, even though I only did Git for f six months. I mean, I'll, I'll take credit for it, but but Git, it's not my it's not my baby. It's it was a side project that I just had to start to actually do Linux development. Linux will always be all of our babies. <laughs> yes, but it is true, I have heard him introduced as the creator of Git before I've heard him introduced as the creator of Linux before. We'll have the link to the complete talk in the show notes. Um, I should say, though, right now it's not publicly available, but I imagine that will change in time. And of course, I recommend you go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes as we release them. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to keep in touch. Help us stay independent and support all of the shows, plus get them ad-free, including Linux Action News, by going to jupiter.party. It is the Jupiter Party membership. We'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. Mm -hmm.